Hey, welcome to or welcome back to Psychotropic Release. Today, I want to talk about the DSM-5, otherwise known as the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. If you don't know what this book is, it's literally the manual or handbook, per se, that mental health professionals use to diagnose mental disorders. So if you've ever been to a psychologist or psychiatrist, this is the book they are referencing. Now, I am aware a new edition of the DSM-5 has recently been published, but this is a book I own and has been used now since 2013. So I'm going to be referring to this edition in this video. So why should we talk about this book if it's meant for professionals? Well, I think if you struggle with mental health issues and are working with a therapist, psychologist, or psychiatrist, it's important to educate yourself a bit on how these professionals categorize and view mental disorders. While the DSM-5 is necessary to have for professionals to be able to understand formal diagnoses and be on the same page when it comes to diagnosing disorders, I think it's also important to recognize that the DSM-5 isn't the end-all be-all. You know, a huge part of my channel is talking about holistic mental health. Looking at mental health from a more dynamic, holistic approach Therefore, I believe mental health should be viewed from a trauma-informed, spiritual, nutritional, environmental, social view, which inevitably leads to questioning and challenging the mainstream Western practices, including the process of diagnosing someone. So there are eight limitations when it comes to the DSM-5 that are important to be aware of. I think the first big major thing that may be obvious is that mental disorders are categorical rather than being discussed or viewed as a spectrum. While this might sound a bit obvious, I think it's really important to note that this is how mental health professionals operate. They see you as either having or not having a given disorder. It's an all or nothing approach. You have depression, you don't have depression, you have borderline personality disorder, or you don't have borderline personality disorder one or the other so you're probably like okay yeah what's the problem i mean that's how a lot of things are that's how physical health issues are you have a sore throat or you don't have a sore throat you have a temperature you don't have a temperature so in the medical world that's how illnesses and disorders are very much viewed but mental health is so much more complex than that there's way more gray area when it comes to mental health and it can be much more complex. Yeah, maybe you have depression, but you may be functional, able to go to work, see friends and use coping mechanisms. Yet another person with depression may literally not be able to get out of bed and is forced to confront suicidal thoughts every day. So mental health is a spectrum, not a black and white category that it's typically viewed from. Of course, putting disorders in categories is efficient for diagnostic and treatment purposes, but it's not realistic when you're really looking at an individual as an individual and their unique symptoms and traumas and backgrounds. In reality, disorders exist along a continuum, meaning patients can have different degrees of the same disorder. Some people experience mild depression while someone else may have chronic severe depression. Now, every disorder in the DSM-5 has a certain amount of symptoms. For example, depression has an X amount of symptoms listed for the disorder, but in order to be officially diagnosed with depression, you need at least five of the symptoms, but it doesn't specify which symptoms. So one person's depression may look vastly different than another person's. The same goes for schizophrenia. The total amount of symptoms listed for schizophrenia is five however a person only needs two of the five symptoms to be diagnosed which means that three people can have the diagnosis of schizophrenia yet all have experienced vastly different symptoms but why is this a problem 
Well, people can exhibit many symptoms and behaviors of a mental health issue, but if they cannot meet the exact minimum criteria, then they cannot be formally diagnosed. Which brings me to my second point. The criteria within the DSM may be too arbitrary or too restrictive. With every disorder, there's a specific set of criteria that specifies a minimum amount of time that symptoms must be present for a patient to qualify for that diagnosis. And a lot of the time, the amount of symptoms that must be present for a certain amount of time is arbitrary and not fully supported by research. Some sets of criteria for particular disorders may be too restrictive so someone may be significantly distressed or impaired yet won't meet the minimum criteria for the disorder that may be the best fit. The DSM-5 does allow practitioners to use other specified or unspecified diagnosis where the criteria are not met. Therefore, people might be diagnosed with either of these other types of disorders, even though the specified disorder may truly be the best fit. Overall, the DSM-5 forces people to be categorized by a disorder, regardless of how disabling the disorder may be for you or how complex your symptoms are. Again, this is a really good example of the frustration I feel with Western mental health practices. The DSM does not take into account childhood trauma or trauma in general, family dynamics, physical health issues, and many more things that can be affecting someone's mental health. The DSM-5 doesn't really account for social factors that might contribute to disorders. It doesn't have any consideration for personal social issues or societal conflicts. While the DSM does address the neurobiological causes of mental illness, which are important and valid, again, there's absolutely nothing that addresses the long-term effects of trauma. Professionals and researchers now know are huge, huge causes for mental health issues in the first place alongside genetics. Now, the next thing is a big one. Psychological disorders were really created in order to ensure payment. Today, for a patient to be reimbursed by health insurance companies, the individual must have symptoms that meet a diagnosis and be formally diagnosed with a disorder. Again, from a medical standpoint, this would make sense that you would need to be diagnosed with an actual issue for health insurance to cover costs. I think this factor alone really contributes to people being overdiagnosed or may receive multiple diagnoses, which if they need, they need it. But there are also other negative psychological effects that this could have on an individual and possibly make them feel more ashamed, alone, crazy, or whatever negative stigma mental illness carries. There was a study that showed that diagnosing kids with ADHD can actually worsen quality of life and increase their chances of self-harm, which makes a lot of sense to me as someone who was diagnosed at 12 with ADHD you're so young, it's hard not to internalize it. And essentially, at least speaking for myself, it feels like you're constantly being told there's something wrong with you, which is really bad for kids' self-esteem. Comorbidity is also super common. About half of the people who have been diagnosed with a DSM-5 disorder have at least one additional disorder. This may be because in some cases the criteria for a disorder have become less strict so then they apply to more people. But some people, professionals and people like myself, wonder if some disorders in the DSM-5 are actually distinct enough. For instance, half of people who meet the criteria for major depressive disorder also have an anxiety disorder. And I think it's very, very safe to say if you have a history of depression, you also suffer from anxiety. 
or if you have ADHD, you have anxiety, so such a high rate of comorbidity suggests that these two types of disorders actually represent the same underlying problem. And the final, but definitely not the least important concern I have about the DSM-5 is that lack scientific evidence. Many proposed diagnoses were not adequately field tested, meaning that mental health clinicians didn't agree on what diagnoses were most appropriate for a given patient pretty much they can't agree entirely on the criteria for each disorder. In fact, more research was supposed to be done on the new criteria, but was canceled due to meeting the publication deadline. So I guess it was more important to publish the book rather than have a more thorough research and understanding. Yikes. One direct consequence of this was that the wording of the criteria that was tested in earlier phases is not the wording in the final version of the DSM-5. So technically the criteria was altered. I don't want to completely demean the DSM-5. Of course it has its uses and it's helpful in many ways, but mental health issues are extremely complex and I think it's important to challenge the system we're so accustomed to. I hope this video was helpful. If you want to hear more about holistic mental health and psychedelics, please hit the subscribe button below.